Hi, um, I'm Julia Lewis. I'm the program director here for the Vanderbilt Nephrology Program, and I've been the program director for over 20 years, maybe even over 25, which makes me feel very old. Um, this is probably the one interview that will be identical to what it would have been if you were actually physically here. Because as I always tell the fellows that come, or fellow applicants that come, is that they can sit back, relax, I'm not actually gonna interview you. Um, I'm happy to train anybody, and obviously over all these years I've trained many different uh, fellows, and so I don't even vote. Um, but what I do do is, because we have a very big faculty, 50 to 70 faculty, you know, 15 to 20 fellows, um, during the course of your interviews, um, lots of conversations will happen, but you might not ever touch on all the information I think you need to help you compare one program to another and make a choice of what's the best program for you. So what I do is basically give you a spiel about the program. And um, I kind of do it casually, and so they'll, you'll, I'll, I'll have a hiccup and I might even go back, but that makes it less boring and make it sound less like a spiel. So first, we're well, off to the races. Uh, why Vanderbilt? Well, Vanderbilt is one of the top programs in the country. So we can argue whether it's number one, number two, number three, whatever, but it's one of the top programs in the country in nephrology. So the question is, and particularly the nephrology training program, by the way. So the question is, why is that important to you? Well, there are several reasons. Of course, the most important reason is that this is probably what you're going to really do, be a nephrologist. So you want to get the very best training that you can. But the other reason is our fellows historically, and by the way, during this talk, I'm going to have some disclaimers and things that I say, I'll tell you more about it later to prove what I'm saying. But anyhow, historically, our fellows have had no trouble finding positions when they leave here, whether they be in um, you know, FDA, industry, academics, private practice, um, very, very diverse um, uh, you know, job descriptions as they leave here. And even if, for example, they have a city, a destination city where no one is hiring in private practice in Charlotte, North Carolina, but that's where they want to go, those practices will open a space for a Vanderbilt Fellow. Can I promise that will always be true? No. This is one of the disclaimers, but it's always been true so far. In addition to the fact that our big faculty know people everywhere. So there's always somebody that can reach out to somebody in particular where you want to be and, and put in a good word for you. So it's good to be at a good program. Now, if you look at the top programs in the country, I'm not going to pick on any particular one, but you know that there are programs that emphasize one kind of training. So I think for your training, there are three areas that are important, and I'm going to say them randomly. Um, clinical research, uh, clinical care, and basic research. Those are the three main areas. And whereas some of the other top programs in the country are really strong in one area, they either aren't very strong in another area, or truth be known, they really want to train in just one area, and the other area is kind of the second class area. Vanderbilt's strength that I think is really important for you is that our program is strong in clinical care, in clinical research, and basic research. And we care about all three, and we're proud to train people in all three areas. Um, and just as an aside, and also to warn you, like when you go on the match, you'll see many of the programs have like, we're, we're looking for two basic researchers, one clinical, da, da, da. Vanderbilt has one list. And we don't distinguish. We take, and this sounds like the Marines, but we take the top seven candidates. And if they're all seven private practice or they're all seven whatever, that's how we do it. We don't discriminate. So we really, we really want to train the best people in the country in all those areas. Now I'll defend that we're really strong in all those three areas in a second. But first what I want to say is why is that important to you to be someplace that's strong in all three areas? Well, first again, um, this is what you're going to do. You're going to be a nephrologist. And let's look at the extremes. Um, we had, um, you know, say you're going to go be in basic research. You're going to come out one week a year, maybe two weeks a year to be an attending. When you come out to be that attending, 
you're the teacher, you're the mentor, you're the faculty member. You want to be super well trained and clinical, so you just get back on that bike and you're a superstar teaching your fellow. On the other extreme, say you're going to be in, I'm not going to, I don't, shouldn't pick on Paducah, Kentucky, but say you're going to be in private practice in Paducah, Kentucky, okay? Small town taking care of patients. You want to have excellent training in clinical research so that you can look at the literature and say, is this a valid study? Is this study something I should implement in my patients? And which of my patients does it really apply to? And even basic research. Um, my partner, Dr. Shulman, who died way too young, um, was largely a clinician and a clinical researcher here at Vanderbilt. But he would read the basic research like a fiend and was one of the first people in the country to ask for an individual IND to use Eclusimab to treat someone with C3GM, which didn't even have a name back then. So even the basic research for the rare patient that you can't figure out how else to help them would be helpful in that setting. So I think you really need good training in all three areas. Do I need to know everything to know about the genetics of colon cancer? Probably not. Do you need to know everything there is to know about the genetics of polycystic kidney disease? Yeah, I think it's important. The other reason I think it's important for you is that you're young in your career. And if you go someplace that has you pigeoned into one spot and you get there and realize that's not actually where your passion is and they either can't move you because they have you pigeoned in that spot or they um, don't have good experience for training in the other spot that puts you in a difficult position. And again, this is a disclaimer. Um, we're a big program. We're flexible. We're dedicated to do the best training that's best for you. And historically, so far, I've always been able to accommodate fellows who have changed their career paths after they get here. We had, for example, um, a fellow who came from the Brigham, had done a bunch of research, was like, I am definitely gonna be a basic researcher. Three months into it, she came to me and said, I didn't become a doctor to do this. I wanna go back on the clinical service. We made it happen. Other extreme, we had a doctor that came from Arizona, where as you know, there's a lot of diabetic nephropathy. And he was, he was practicing there as an internist, wanted to bring nephrology back there to that community got here, fell in love with basic research, and is now doing such basic research at another academic center, actually, um, that I can't t totally tell it's nephrology. So we provide our fellows the opportunity to make those decisions after they get here. Usually we ask to them to try to make it by sort of the um, end of the first half of their first year. Now. Can I promise it will always be true that I can accommodate everybody? No, I can't promise that. I can just tell you we have so far. So now let me go ahead and pause and go ahead and defend my statement that we're strong in all three areas. And again, I'm gonna randomly pick which one to start with and I'll start with basic research. Okay, Dr. Harris, our former division chief, who's now our assistant division chief, was the president of ASN. He's one of the leading basic researchers in nephrology in our country. Roy Zent, another one of our faculty members, is the, I always get this slightly wrong, but like vice chair for research for the entire medical center campus. Billy Hudson um, is on track to get a Nobel Prize for his work in collagen. Um, our basic research is one of our big claims of fame nationwide. Now I'm going to make some comments that are true for both basic research and clinical research. So um, we have tons of basic research and clinical research in our division, and I can't possibly summarize it all. And no one you're going to interview with can possibly summarize it all because it's really just too broad. Um, so what I recommend is that you go online, look at our faculty, don't even just read what we have on our website because they forget to put everything on there, but PubMed them and see where their publications are. And then you'll see what all their areas of research interests are. Another really important point for both basic and clinical research is that in many um, nephrology divisions, when you as a fellow go into research, since they're paying your salary, you have to pick one of their faculty to work with. That's not true here. 
we will pay your salary to go work in physiology, to go work in ID. We've even had people go over off the medical center side into the university side to do what was their interest area in research. Um, that's a big advantage. So then when you look at what are my research opportunities at Vanderbilt, it's not only the entire medical center campus, it's the entire university campus as well. And so I think that is a strong advantage. Clinical research. So we have the Vanderbilt Clinical Trial Center um, and the Vanderbilt Clinical Trial Center has been in existence 30 plus years. Um, we are the only academic center in the United States to do all the NIH sponsored clinical trials from pilot through the end of the phase three trial. Um, we also did the capture pearl trial, put ACE-ARB, um, which is one of our big interventions on the map. The collaborative study group, which did those trials, is housed here at Vanderbilt now. In addition, for example, Dr. Kisler, our current division chief, is a leader in single or um, you know, three or four center studies that are generating the hypothesis that then go on to clinical trials as well as he does clinical trials in his lab group as well. We have people whose interests are in um, diversity. We have people whose interest is health um, literacy, num num numeracy, um, it goes on and on. Again, all the things I said for basic research, I can't summarize it. PubMed our clinical research faculty. And remember, the whole campus belongs to you as a potential source of research mentors. I will make a comment that when we send you off, if you choose to do your research outside the division, you will, or in the division for that matter, but you will always have a mentor committee. We will be on that mentor committee. We will make sure that you're making appropriate progress wherever, wherever you choose to do your research um, on the Vanderbilt campus. How about clinical? Well, Vanderbilt is the trauma center for the area. We have the only burn unit. We have a major stroke neuro ICU unit. Um, we have, we are a um, national cancer center design, de designation. So that's like MD Anderson and things. We have a beautiful ICU tower. Um, we are the tertiary and quaternary referral center for the area. Um, most importantly, we also have a very large internal practice of bread and butter, diabetic, hypertensives, et cetera, to add to our fascinomas that we get in from other places. Um, Vanderbilt has um, just a beautiful facility. Um, you won't feel bad that your patients are housed there. Um, and it, it is a very strong thing. In ter terms of broad things about the Vanderbilt nephrology division in general, um, we do well over 250 transplants last year in 2019, and we're on target to probably beat 300 this year in 2020. We own two dialysis units, outpatient units. Why is that important? Well, when you go there for your outpatient um, ESRD experience, you aren't going to a unit that's owned by someone else whose staff um, don't want to make time for you. It's our unit. So our water tech guy is going to spend hours with you teaching you about the water room. The dietitian is going to teach you about renal diet. The social worker is going to teach you about all the Byzantine Medicare rules that apply to dialysis patients. So it's a much richer experience. Also, if you look across the country, about 10% of patients do home therapy. Here at Vanderbilt, we're at 40% and have been for a very long time. Um, I used to have the PD program Dr. Goper does now, and we're, we're, home, we're home aficionados. So we've, we've got a lot of experience. There's a lot of patience, and that's often one of the things our fellows bring to the practices they go to or the academic centers they go to, which is an expertise in home therapies. We also do metabolic workups of um, kidney stones, not found in very many places. And again, something our fellows can bring that expertise to their next position. We have, um, let me make sure I didn't, we have, um, I'm gonna cheat on my notes, which I do if you were sitting here too. Um, we have point of care ultrasound. We have PD, urgent PD, CRT, what used to be called SLED, 
of course, all the general hemo, hemodialysis. We have several faculty members that are interested in, um, the, in research in the area of these modalities. So we are on the forefront of doing new things with the modalities. Um, we have um, plasmapheresis is done by us at the hospital. Um, so we do all of that. We literally do plasmapheresis seven days a week. Um, and so that's again, a specialty that you could bring with you. Um, so I think that's a good overview about the clinical program um, here at Vanderbilt. Um, and we'll get into more specifics in a minute. So we have a two year and a three year track. The two year track is um, 18 months of clinical rotations and six months of research. During your six months of research, you have two half days of clinic a week and are available to help out with biopsies and things on the fly. But the rest of that time is protected. You have an identified mentor, mentor identified project, and a plan for you to present it. Again, as you go from institution to institution, I suspect you will not very often find that much truly protected time to have at least some research experience uh, in your fellowship. Um, often it's like while you're on an easy rotation, try to write a paper. Um, but this is a, a for real opportunity and we think it's really important no matter what your career goals are. Our two-year fellows follow a lot of different career paths. Obviously, many of them go into private practice, but also clinical academic positions have been filled. If you make good use of that six months, um, like one of our um, former fellows now is the, he spent his six months in clinical trials um, center here at Vanderbilt and is now heading up a clinical trial center at another academic cent center and is about to become associate professor. I just wrote a letter. Um, so that's just an example. Um, we've also had people go to the FDA. We have two fac former fellows who are actually married to each other um, on the FDA right now. We've had people go into industry or biotech, um, uh, biotech uh, advice and research analysis. All kinds of things happen with that two-year fellowship because of that six months of protected time that really gives you an opportunity to take it an extra step. Um, so then we also have a, what we call a three-year fellowship, which is 12 months of clinical rotations followed by two or more years of research. And as you well know, if you've not ever done truly basic research before, two years of research training after your 12 months of clinical may not be enough for you to launch your career and get your first grants. Um, and again, disclaimer, we've always been able to find, we have a training grant, of course, but we've always been able to find funding to fund you for more years, as many years as you need. Um, can I promise we'll always find funding? No, but so far so good. And remember, we own our own two dialysis units. That helps as well. We have a master's of public health here, a master's of clinical science investigation, a master's of education, and we've recently connected with our business school for um, MBA opportunities for our trainees. So again, on the training grant, we have tuition money for two people to participate in that master's program. Um, another disclaimer, we've had years where more than two people wanted to do it, but we, uh, have always found the money. Will we always be able to find the money? I can't promise that, but we have been able to so far in the 20 plus years I've been at the job, and I don't foresee any reason that that won't be true in the future. So that's an overview of the program in sort of a big way. And now I'm gonna go through the specifics and um, I sort of mix it up because um, I do this many, many times usually, but I guess for this season, I only have to do it once. Um, but we'll start out with our rotations. First, there's the Vanderbilt um, consult rotation. And at the same time, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Vanderbilt ESRD rotation. So the Vanderbilt consult rotation is just what it sounds like. It's consults, all acute renal failure, electrolyte disorders, um, plasmapheresis needs, et cetera. 
Vanderbilt ESRD is any ESRD patient that's admitted that we consult on. Um, both of those rotations, you are only a consultant, so you are never the person who writes the admission orders on either of those. The Vanderbilt Consult Service has um, one attending and two fellows. The Vanderbilt ESRD Service has one attending, one nurse practitioner who works pretty independently, um, and one fellow. The average census on the consult service is probably between 20-ish, 20, 25. Um, the ESRD service is about the same. So what's a day in the life like on those two services? We are not allowed in the hospital before 5.30. Um, depending on how efficient you are and how big your service is, you'll come in whenever. Um, you're expected to have seen the patients that are yours prior to when the attending comes. Um, I'd like you to go ahead and write, get your notes in the computer because I think it's efficient because we have Epic. And so when you open Epic, um, the way we have it set up for nephrology, you can get all the information you need about the patient in the templated note and you just need to add your impression. I think it's important for you to commit to what you think that patient has and what they need that day and your attending and their attestation can always modify it if they don't agree. Many of the attendings don't say that. They say you can write your notes later. Don't worry about it. Just see them. Wh whichever. Um, I think both have educational value. The attendings come, it varies a little bit, again, by the day in the attending, somewhere between 8.30, 9 o'clock. Rounds end at the latest at 11. From 11 to 12, if you haven't already, um, you do your handovers, your orders for the next day, etc. From 12 to 1, Every day we have a lecture. During that lecture time, the nurses and other people are not allowed to page you, so you have protected time. They're supposed to call the attendings, which really cut down on phone calls, by the way. Um, and my fellows always tell me that I should tell every applicant this, we provide lunch every day, Monday through Friday, because each of those lectures is accompanied with a lunch. And we have a COVID plan for that. Um, so. Uh, then for, after your lecture at one o'clock from one to two, the fellow who is on the consult service, the fellow who are on the ESRD service, the two fellows on the consult service and the fellow on the ESRD service, hand over their service to the afternoon fellow. The afternoon fellow is a whole separate rotation. It is probably one of the most popular things here in the Vanderbilt Nephrology <laughs> training program. I have to say it was my idea, but okay. But what happens is you get to stay home all morning, um, I'm sure studying nephrology. Um, you come in for your noon lecture, and then at one o'clock, these services get handed over to you, and you cover them until 6 p.m., and at 6 p.m., the on-call per, on person comes. Um, so uh, it, it is a way to get our morning fellows out of the hospital um, by two o'clock. And it also provides a rotation where you have your, your mornings free. And I know there are a few things like go to the dentist or whatever that are easier to do in the morning. So our, um, uh, our next rotation that I'm gonna talk about is transplant. Um, now transplant is our only service that actually does have an inpatient service. They have a service of 10 patients that have um, an intern, a resident, you as our you know regular nephrology fellow and we also have a transplant fellowship here um, and so it, there's another fellow who's completed their nephrology fellow fellowship and is doing an extra year of transplant training your job is to supervise the intern and resident so you come in at whatever time you feel you need to to do that so you supervise the intern and resident and are kind of like the mini attending on the case um, and are part of being prepared to help the intern and resident pre um, present the cases to the transplant attending. You also cover um, up to, but no more than eight um, transplant patients that are not admitted to our transplant service. So they're admitted to like open heart surgery or you know, whatever, orthopedics. And so you just do a consult note, a consult or consult progress note on them. We are a combined transplant program with the VA. We are one of 
um, four VAs in the country that do renal transplant, which um, makes our VA have a um, special renal uh, emphasis. Um, so usually the VA has one or two patients, or zero to three probably is the range um, there. They're all admitted to a medicine service, and you're just a consultant um, for them. Um, other experiences on transplant, they have their own lecture every Friday morning, so that's an addition to our lecture series that's on, at noon on Monday through Friday. Um, and you will be participating in that lecture series. Um, and it also includes a PATH um, a lecture. Um, they have, uh, you have the opportunity to go harvest a kidney, you have the opportunity to implant a kidney, you have the opportunity to go to UNOS. Um, so there's a lot involved in our transplant uh, experience. Obviously you have opportunities to do transplant biopsies. Um, so the transplant fellow comes in, as I said, whenever. It's probably later, maybe 7.30, 8-ish. Um, and then around 3 or 4 o'clock, our transplant fellow hands over their service to that afternoon fellow um, to cover until 6 o'clock. And I just want to talk a little bit about it. It might sound like, gee, three people are getting it. You know, the daytime fellow, the um, afternoon fellow, and then the on-call. But think about it. For virtually all the patients, we're consultants. And for nephrology, the money's in the labs that are done in the morning. So basically, we are handing over, um, basically the patients are tucked um, in the morning by the main teams. And the afternoon person is really mostly dealing with new consults or new admissions that need a consult. Um, they do reround on all the CRT patients. So the afternoon rotation um, um, are the ones that do the second set of rounds on our CRT patients. And for example, if the patient, you know, the consult service was in the operating room all morning, they'll be signed out to get checked on by the afternoon fellow. The afternoon fellow can be busy or it can be an opportunity for them to teach. There's one thing you have noticed that I haven't said at all about our rotations, and that is that on our consult rotations, we sometimes have residents, we almost always have students. And I know that that might be different with COVID next year in terms of the students, it's not clear yet. But um, we don't count them in our work effort. This is another important thing for you to look at when you go from program to program. Many programs really have a significant amount of the workload being done by residents, and that's not true for us. Our workload is very reasonable and it's covered by us. If the residents are there and they pick up some of the workload, great. But really, we use this as an opportunity to educate them and to watch you teach them and help improve your um, educator skills, if you will. The next rotation I'm going to talk about is the VA, which brings to mind another important point about our program. With one exception, when you go to the rotation that's in our outpatient dialysis unit, everything is on this campus. So our VA is one building away from Vanderbilt. I think that's really important. Driving all the way across town to get to a lecture or driving all the way across town when you're on call to go from one hospital to another, having done it when I was a fellow, is super stressful. You park here at Vanderbilt, you're, you have access to everything you're gonna cover on call ever, and you have access to um, our main hospitals, which is the VA in Vanderbilt. Our VA is like all VAs, um, same paint, same rules. I actually suspect sometimes that they just bust the patients from one VA to another, just kidding. Um, the VA has one attending, one fellow. It's a smaller service. It probably averages between five and 12. Um, and it uh, has somewhat lower acuity patients than Vanderbilt, um, but it does have a home program, a plasmapheresis program, um, and it has more glomerular disease than you would expect at the average VA because we're designated as a VA renal um, hub. In addition, it has an outpatient dialysis unit in the VA. Um, and that's separate from our two privately owned by us dialysis units. 
Um, that VA um, outpatient unit is housed within the VA hospital, so it's on our campus. And when you're on the VA rotation, in the afternoons, you spend time in the outpatient dialysis unit. Um, it is run beautifully. Um, it is, you will learn a ton from the nurses and Dr. Carrie Cavanaugh and Dr. Adriana Hung, who run that unit, um, will teach you a ton about the practice and excellent care of dialysis patients. And I know this won't surprise you, it's not exactly run in a financially efficient way, <laughs> run by our government. Um, but uh, it is a great learning opportunity of an ideal way to provide care, and it's so deserving that our fellow that our our veterans get that there. So the next rotation I'm going to talk about is our outpatient ESRD. So we have two outpatient dialysis units. People generally choose to do their rotation at the larger one. There's a nurse practitioner there that will supervise your experience um, while you're there and you have a whole checklist of 20 plus things that you have to get checked off um, that you've done. So you will spend time, as I alluded to earlier, with the water people and they'll sign off on it, the dietitian, the social worker, you'll attend um, CQI meetings, you'll attend other quality meetings led by the medical director, you'll learn what it really means to be a medical director, you'll round on shifts and see patients. Um, it's just a, a really rich experience. And no matter what you do in the future, almost always you're gonna have some contact with outpatient ESRD. The next rotation I'll talk about is our pathology rotation. Um, we're extremely blessed here at Vanderbilt. We have one of the best um, renal pathologists in the world, Dr. Agnes Fogo. She runs a renal pathology fellowship. So she has people in pathology who are trained to be specifically renal pathologists. She's our current president of ISN, which is a huge compliment for a pathologist. She's on the editorial board of every renal journal there is. She teaches at all the board review courses. Um, and you will, when you're on that rotation with her, get here at around 10, 1030 in the morning. She will have slide sets set up for you and her trainees which you will go through, and you better go through them because she's a stern taskmaster. Um, and then she'll come in the late afternoon to go over whatever assignments she gave you and, and then do new biopsies. Um, you do stay a little later on that one. You stay till probably six, seven o'clock at night. Um, she's just traditionally always read her slides late in the day. It's great for us because we get reads the same day we do our biopsies. Um, she gets biopsies from all over the world, so you get lots of interesting biopsies. Our fellows never need to go to pathology, um, review courses to get prepared for boards. I mean, they know it all. I mean, it is extremely rare for them not to get 100% on their path board questions. Um, so it's a great experience. The next rotation is called interventional radio, I mean, I'm sorry, pathology is part of a re interve uh, rotation that's pathology, interventional radiology, and peds nephrology. So you'll do pathology once, um, and we encourage you to do it the first, the first go around when you have that rotation. Um, and then you can do interventional radiology and peds nephrology at the same time, because they're not very time consuming. Um, for those of you who do 18 months of clinical, you'll have the opportunity to do each one of those once if you want to do them all separately. Interventional radiology, we have wonderful interventional radiologists both here at Vanderbilt and at the VA who welcome you to come put in lines, um, see how they declot accesses, um, just all the nephrologic aspects of IR. Disclaimer. Um, we do not intend to train you to be interventional nephrologists. Um, we don't view that as our mission. It takes two to 2,000 to 3,000 patients in a single city to be coming to your interventional nephrology center for it to be financially feasible, and there are just too few of those spots in the country. We have trained one fellow to do so, um, but it was by partnering with another institution when he in his second year did his six months of research we partnered with the institution that had an interventional nephrology program and he he was able to do it can i promise we'll always be able to do that no but we were um peds nephrology we have one of the 
best children's hospitals and it is so beautiful. There is art everywhere, including on the top of the elevators so that there's something to um, entertain or catch the children's eyes. Um, we have five or six pediatric nephrologists at any time uh, attendings. That, believe it or not, is a really big program for pediatric nephrology. Um, you will both learn two important things, even if you think you're never gonna wanna take care of kids. Well, actually three. Um, first off, in clinic, you'll see all kinds of things that you don't see in the adult clinics because it's genetic, young diagnosis. Um, in the hospital, you'll learn how to take care of an emergent pediatric nephrology problem. And no matter where you are almost, probably not the FDA, but if you're in private practice or you're in academics, there will be a time where you will be covering a child or where she had a baby um, for a certain amount of time before you can transport them to a children's hospital. And you need to know what you're gonna do. What's your strategy? How are you gonna handle that? They are truly different. Um, so I think that's important. And then also, obviously, boards has questions on it about peds nephrology. And so you get a really good a a chance to connect what you're reading with actual patients. Um, so let's see, our next rotation, and I think our last one that we haven't talked about yet, is um, ambulatory. The ambulatory rotation is exactly what it sounds like. Um, it's a bunch of clinics. Um, so Vanderbilt has for longer than I've been here, so you can imagine how long that is, been a hypertension center and had a funded grant from the NIH for hypertension research. Um, one of our former fellows and one of my former chief fellows, and by the way, every year we, the fellows and faculty elect a chief fellow, um, heads up that hypertension program now, Dr. Luther. So you spend a half day in his clinic learning about a lot of really interesting secondary hypertension um, patient problems. Um, in addition to our interest in metabolic stone disease, we collaborate with a urologist who has an interest in metabolic stone disease, and you spend a half day with him. You spend time with our access surgeons. You spend time in extra special transplant clinics, like for the donor workup or um, you know, uh, all kinds of recipient updates, et cetera. So you also have an opportunity to spend a lot of time in our home unit. So in addition to spending time when you're on the outpatient ESRD rotation and when you're at the VA, um, you also have time in ambulatory where you're assigned specific um, home therapy uh, clinics. So there really is a, a wide range of specialty clinics um, that you get exposed to during that ambulatory time. So now I'm gonna to switch to the didactics because th that's what I'm gonna say about the rotations. Um, I've already given you a heads up. Um, we have five lectures a week at noon on Fridays. We also have an access conference every other week. And when you're on transplant, you go to the transplant conference. Um, we probably have more conferences, but we've just run out of time slots. Um, and as my fellows say, don't forget to tell them that you get lunch. Um, I think our lectures are not only numerous, but really excellent. Um, on Mondays, it's our chief fellows day for, for lecture. It's usually a board review or ethics, or we bring in people to talk about career paths and how to succeed at them. Um, it's a, the chief fellow colors it a little bit, depending on the chief fellow. Um, so it varies a little bit from, it, from year to year. On Tuesdays, our chief fellow and Dr. Um, Bergner, who is in charge of the didactics, is my associate program director and was our fellow chief fellow and got her master's of education here, um, do run our Tuesday conference. So one Tuesday a month, it's PATH. Dr. Fogo and her entire team come. Um, we do two cases uh, and it's a vigorous discussion of the differential and then Dr. Fogo asks our fellows to come read the slides with her and her team's support. Um, and then we read the report um, so that we can connect what we talk about with what you're gonna see when you get a report um, of, on, on your own patients. Um, two Tuesdays a month, it's clinical case presentation. And it's sort of like our fellows doing a mini grand round. So our fellows present a case and then present the topic that the case is about. 
Um, it's a formal slide presentation. Our chief fellow schedules it so it's you have plenty of time. You're on an easy rotation to get it all put together. A faculty member will mentor you not only in the subject matter, but in slides and communication skills. You will be evaluated by two faculty members while you give it slide by slide for tips um, to improve your communication skills. And then the fourth Tuesday of the month is Journal Club. Um, and Journal Club, is, this Journal Club is a serious journal club where you, you know, not only present the you present the previous uh, information on whatever that article is about. So like put it in context. What are the previous papers? And then you go through the paper in a very organized way um, with pauses for comments and questions. Um, so it's, it's a, a journal club that's taken seriously, which reminds me, I told you I'd jump around and forget, on one Monday a month we do peritoneal dialysis or home dialysis um, journal club. And that is a totally casual journal club. So you can either pick an article or Dr. Gopur or I will assign you an article if you'd rather, we do so, and you just read it and you present it. Um, no slides, um, it's a format um, for us to talk about PD and home hemo, to talk about the language, to, to just make you feel more and more comfortable with it. Um, PD, uh, because of the nature of it being a smaller amount of the pop dialysis population, many of the studies are underpowered so, or have other issues with them. So we also use it as a format to teach you how to critique the quality of a paper. Now we do that in our regular journal club on Tuesdays as well. In fact, embedded in our regular journal club on Tuesdays are actual questions to the fellows that relate to the statistical analysis of the papers. On Wednesday at noon is a, um, probably one of our most popular lectures, which is physiology. It's led by Dr. Bave and several of our other faculty members, and it's a two-year cycle, and it goes through not only the physiology of the multiple epithelial cell types and transport processes in the kidney, many of the lectures being given to you by the people who discovered them and described them, <clears throat> but also the physiology of peritoneal membrane transport, the immunology of transplant, um, again, some basic hypertension physiology, um, and it's taught by the Socratic method. So you're given a reading assignment, and then um, the faculty member asks questions and stimulates conversation that way. So it isn't just a straight out lecture, it's a very interactive session, and our fellows really like it. Thursdays at noon, we have um, our renal grand rounds, um, and that many doctors from the community come, all our faculty and fellows come, many of the lab people come. Um, we bring about 10 speakers in a year. Um, anybody pretty much will come here because, again, we're big and people know us, and so almost everybody has a friend here that they'd like to come see. Um, so really, it's just whoever's running it that year's choice of who to bring in. Um, our own faculty are excellent speakers. Um, most of us have or are teaching board review, ASM board review. Um, by the way, we always have a member of our faculty working on the in-training exam questions and the board questions um, nationally doesn't mean we tell you those questions, but it does mean that we always have a finger on what's important um, in those exams. So renal grand rounds, I joke that if you just sat there and learned everything that in a two-year cycle of renal grand rounds, you could probably pass boards, um, but most things you're going to hear about many more times than that. Friday morning, we have research con conference. Um, it's not well time for when you're on the busy clinical services. But during, obviously, if you do the three-year program during your two years of research, you're expected to attend. During your six months of research, during the two years, you're expected to attend. And when you're on a rotation that isn't busy at that time in the morning, you're expected to attend. Um, it's always super interesting. Um, it's both clinical and basic research. At noon on fr Fridays, <coughs> excuse me, um, we have a lecture series that, again, is a two-year cycle. And we take every single topic that ACGME says you need to learn about and we give you a lecture. Um, so how does that differ from renal grand rounds? Well, if I one of my areas of interest and that I've published a lot in is diabetic nephropathy. 
If I go to renal grand rounds, I'm going to give a few minutes of sort of an overview of diabetic nephropathy, but then I'm going to plunge in to the latest study we did or into something novel um, or study we're about to do. On Fridays, though, um, what we do is I do is start out with, you know, what's the epidemiology, what's the physiology, you know, what's the natural history, go over all the historic key studies, um, and then maybe a little bit about what's coming on the horizon. So it's the basics. Um, we do take attendance at all our lectures. We have a professionalism metric um, where we put a number on your professionalism and the big component of that number is your attendance at lectures. And I think I've already mentioned that you're not allowed to get paged during your lecture time so that you could spend your whole time listening. We also record all the lectures and um, we've always done that pre-COVID. Um, and they're available to you to review if either you missed it because you were on vacation or something, or you have um, you know, a question about it, or you just want to listen to it again because you really liked it. Um, so that's always available to you as well. Um, so that's our lecture series. The next thing I'm going to talk about is our clinics. So you do a continuity clinic um, for a year with an attending. Um, and since our patients are all assigned to specific attending, which we really did to improve patient care so that patients don't say, I have Dr. Vanderbilt, right? They have Dr. Lewis, they have Dr. Um, McCall, they have a, a, a faculty member who is their doctor. Um, our fellows, when we made that change, which was more than 15 years ago, um, probably liked it better than the faculty or patients did even in some ways because it means our patients do not use the ER as their outpatient clinic because they can reach their attending at all times. And when a patient does need to be admitted, you've got someone to call who knows this patient very well, can put it in perspective what they're presenting with. So you will be paired with one attending and you will pretty much um, see, see the patients and then the attending will see them. And I do want to stop here because it's a good moment to talk about our general philosophy of how we run the fellowship. And it's going to sound simplistic, but um, honestly, it really works well, and it's not as simplistic as it sounds. Our goal is to have you be an attending. When you walk away from your fellowship, we're not going to be standing behind you anymore. So our goal in each and every encounter is to let you get first stabs at the patient, assessing them, coming up with a plan, um, and then each and every time you will have an attending come behind you or with you for a second visit um, to go over your plan, to critique it, to you know say, you know, that's a great plan, you can do it that way, but have you thought about this way? Um, we think it's the best of both worlds. You're not just seeing patients by yourself and learning by doing, um, but on the other hand, and this is another disclaimer, if you wanna come to a program where the attending's walking in and running the show and you're just standing quietly behind them, this would be the wrong program. Um, our residents highly respect the renal fellows. Um, they may not know, well, they for sure don't know the GI fellows' names or the endocrine. They may know of some of the cardiology fellows' names, but they definitely know all the nephrology fellows' names, and they really rely on you for your expertise and turn to you first but you'll always have a faculty member backing you up. So anyhow, same thing in clinic. You'll be the first one in to see the patient. You'll interact, get the history, develop the plan, and then each time an attending will come back in with you or talk with you about them and go back in um, to, to complete the visit. So after your first year of continuity clinic, you have a choice. You can stay with the same attending, and the advantage of that is that you'll see the same patients for two years which is kind of cool. Um, or you can switch attendings. And the advantage of that is that at the level of nephrology that we're practicing, um, there aren't clinical trials to guide all that we're doing. So a relapsing for the third time membranous GN is treated one way by me and a different way by Dr. Bergner. 
Um, and so if you switch attendings, you get to see a little bit different approach and that there isn't just one way to manage everything. So fellows are allowed to choose which they want to do. And again, a disclaimer, I've never had a riot where everybody wanted one thing and I couldn't give it to everybody. Everybody's always gotten what they wanted. So it's always worked out really, really well. Um, so the next thing is evaluations. Um, we evaluate you, you evaluate us, your peers evaluate you, the patients evaluate you, our, we do 360 evaluations. Actually, nephrology here at Vanderbilt, we're the very first people, and this shows you how old I am, um, to do 360 evaluations. And that's because nephrology, when it was funded by Medicare, was fund, funded as a team the dietitian, social worker, nurse, and doctor. So we've always been set up to have a team multidisciplinary approach to patient care. So it was a breeze to come up with the 360s. You are, you will meet with me at the very, you have to meet with me at the six, 12, 18, 24 month marks. So twice a year, you will meet with Dr. A. Kisler, our division chief, at least once a year. And then I also assigned you a faculty advocate. And that word's picked very particularly. Um, it's not necessarily someone that is in the area that you think you want to go into. It's like, I, you know, it's not a basic researcher if you want to do basic research or a clinical researcher if you want to do clinical research. It is some, and you will meet with them at three and nine months and whatever that is. 15 and <laughs> the next one. Um, and so you will meet with them twice a year minimum. Um, and obviously all of us have open doors, so you will meet with us as much as you want, but at least that. And so it means that there are two faculty members who are tracking your progress, tracking what you think about the program. Um, if you hate me, you have someone else to talk to and you can complain about me. Um, and it's just, it's just another person to be in your corner and help you. So um, you have plenty of room for evaluations. Um, the other thing I'm gonna talk about, because um, this comes up and I just finished our 12 month evaluations. Um, when we get to the part of the evaluation of the program where I say to the fellows, are there any suggestions you have for things we can improve? They virtually always answer 100%. Um, no, not really, because we're improving all the time. And here at Vanderbilt, we're really fortunate. We were um, on the ground floor and we were a test center for a program called Kinexus, which is in many hospitals across the country now and actually in some businesses. Um, and it's based on a Japanese principle that everybody takes ownership for the organization um, and that you don't work around a problem, you fix it. Um, so we put in opportunities for improvement. Um, there's an app on your phone, so you can be rounding, see something, think of it, and put it in, and it will come to me. I'll assign it to someone. It'll have a due date. Um, if the due date comes and it's not done, I'm going to follow up on it. Um, it, had, it. It is used for all kinds of things. It's used for things like there are no blinds in our workroom, and the sun is shining on our computers, and we get blinds for the workroom. Um, it's also used in very serious situations. Um, we had a, one of our fellows removed a femoral catheter in a patient's room, just like we were all trained to do, put pressure on it and left. The nurse didn't know she, she had done that um, and got the patient up on a chair, unfortunately didn't give the patient a call light. This was many, many years ago. And the patient bled to death in the chair. It was a tragic, tragic um, scenario. The fellow who had done everything just like we all, our policy was to do, headed up that quality improvement project in Kinexus. Um, and the safety things we put in so that never ever happened again were actually adopted by the state of Tennessee and every hospital was asked to implement them. So, and many of you I know have sat in M&Ms where people come up with five things that need to be fixed and you realize that after everybody walks out and a week or so passes, four out of the five or maybe all five get forgotten. Um, that's not what happens with this program. So it, it also applies to lots of things. When Epic came, we tons of our OIs centered around changing things for Epic. Um, so it's really broad. Anything can be in there. We, we can fix just about anything. Um, doesn't always mean that we end up all agreeing with the suggested change, um, but we can all think about it and reach a consensus. 
um, call in the schedule. So I do the schedule. Um, I work it around your vacation requests. And basically the way we work vacation is it's, it's not a three week block that you have to take, um, but you have to take it during rotations, certain rotations. So you tell me when you want time off. And so you can take a week here and a week there and a week there, and then we work your schedule around it. I'm not gonna talk to you a lot about call because the chief fellow does the call schedule. I can tell you that everybody does the same number of microseconds of call. Um, I haven't heard a complaint about call in years, so I think our chief fellow is doing a good job. Um, we have worked very, very hard and have had numerous opportunities for improvement um, that have worked around reducing calls, even phone calls. It is home call. Most of you don't have experience with home call, but you're at home. You may not come in at all. You may not even get a phone call, or you may have a night where you come in a lot because you have three transplants that come in that need to be evaluated by you for the safety to go into the OR. Um, I would say that it's about a third, a third, and a third, but I'm gonna let the fellows tell you what they think. A third of the time, it's super quiet. A third of the time, you're pretty busy. Um, and a third of the time, um, it's maybe some phone calls and not much more than that. Um, two of your call nights you have off the next day or you have off until noon the next day if you have clinic um, so out of and it, you do about three or four calls a month um, in the second year it's less than the first year um, so i'll let you ask them more questions about call i'll give you just one more example like we write peritoneal dialysis orders that say if something goes wrong at night just stop it and we'll deal with it in the morning so you don't get a phone call. And often, even with CRT, that can be done if it's optional for the patient to do okay without it overnight. So we work hard and are very serious about protecting your time. Um, the last thing, or second to last thing I'll talk about is benefits. So um, when you get here, um, you will get a couple books. Um, you'll get an iPad that has Epic on it. Um, the Epic iPad, uh, is a very valuable tool. Um, some of our fellows run with it all day in the hospital. It's certainly a valuable tool when you're at home. You can even put dialysis orders in from it. Um, you get three weeks of vacation. Um, you are a PGY, whatever you are, and get paid like that. And it's also got a regional differential. Um, you get $1,500 a year for books or travel. Again, a disclaimer, I've had years where you know people had to go to a CRT meeting to present an abstract and Europe and needed more than that and I've come up with the funds. Can I promise I always can come up with the funds? No, I can't promise it, but so far so good. Um, you have all the usual health benefits and um, other kinds of benefits and we actually, um, if you were here, we would hand you a packet that identifies those benefits, but we will be transmitting those to you so you can review them. Um, I feel like I'm forgetting something about our benefits, but um, it may come to me in a minute. Um, the last thing I'm going to talk about, because it's hard not to talk about it right now, is COVID. Um, and I'm going to make just a couple comments about it. Again, as is typical for nephrology, we were at the forefront of, uh, had the first Zoom meeting here. Um, and then, of course, everybody's having Zoom meetings now. Also, we recognize that residents get experience with ventilators as in the ICU. They get experience on ID. They get experience with a lot of things. but nobody can do dialysis except our faculty and our fellows so early on i went to the department of medicine and i went to the gme office and our faculty and fellows were sheltered so we were saved and they never needed to come ask us to serve in the icu or serve in the er or serve anywhere else um, many of us volunteered to get trained to do those things um, and i I thought it'd be fun to learn all ventilators again and get a refresher and the ICU attendings let me do it, but said there's no way ventilators are easy, but no one can do dialysis. That's way too hard. Honestly, it's not too hard, but let's not tell them. Um, we also are a big program and because we are a big program and many of the rotations like ambulatory were very slow, we were able to shelter half the fellows for seven days and then with the other half of the fellows covering the essential services and then switch. So every other week you were on or every other week you were home sheltering. 
That also was to protect you as a resource so everybody didn't get sick at the same time. Nobody got COVID, by the way. Um, we averaged, I think our peak was 30 plus cases, 30 something, um, and we did not exhaust our resources. And I have to say, I'm extraordinarily proud of what a great job Vander Vanderbilt did in providing PPE and support um, to us during that time period. Um, I'm hoping this won't be a topic we'll need to think too hard about next winter, but um, I'm suspicious that we will. Uh, I just want you to know that we're super prepared, both nephrology and Vanderbilt, the UMC. I think that's everything. Um, I don't think I forgot any huge topic. Um, if you have any questions, um, you can reach out to me. You can reach out to our wonderful um, program coordinator, Tammy, who you've already had many cheery interactions with, I know. She's actually a huge asset to our program. Um, and um, that's it. Don't hesitate to reach out. I hope I've given you enough information to know who we are and recognize whether or not your career girls are a good fit for our program.